Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our third Marketing Club webinar of our current series. We've got a really great session with Sophie Wooler, Chief Operating Officer at Digital Marketing Agency Crowd, and I'm very hot topic right now. That's AI. Sophie will be discussing some of the best and most popular generative tools out in the market today and how they can be leveraged to drive business growth. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today's session, Sophie Wooler. If you would like to turn on your webcam, Sophie, I'll pass things over to you and away you go when you're ready. Thank you so much, Phil. So firstly, thank you very much for having me. Um, as Phil said, I'm going to be talking for 40 to 45 minutes um, about all things generative AI. Um, and I think it's important just as a quick bit of context to give some context to my experience and why the angle that I'm going to take today is particularly focused around digital marketing. Um, I work for Crowd, who are a global digital marketing agency. Um, and what that means is that we focus on things like pay-per-click, PPC, um, the ads that you see on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. We focus on how we can make um, your organic search rankings better. And over time, we have also um, added on additional services looking at things like creative. I am not a creative person, so thank goodness for mid-journey because it really does hide a multitude of sins. But it means that the advice that I'm going to be giving you today, the examples that I'm going to be given, um, are perhaps more on that kind of performance digital angle and slightly less so on how to build a brilliant creative production engine. But we will touch on that briefly as well. So um, we're going to start with some key concepts. Um, so a little bit of theory before we then go into some of the more practical tools that are um, available to you. Um, the reason that I want to start here is that when we think about AI, people's minds very often jump to Skynet, The Matrix, a um, bit of Star Trek commander data here. And defining and understanding this stuff properly is really helpful. It means you kind of know what tools you have when people are saying to you, would you like a machine learning led model? You know what that means. But to do that properly takes years and years of study and I've got about five minutes. Um, so if we do have any data scientists on the call, I'm, I'm really sorry, um, but we're gonna go through some top level um, definitions just to orient us all. So starting with AI, um, the definition that I would use, and there are lots of slightly um, conflicting ones, AI is any computer system that takes in data and uses it to make a decision um, about the output that it should give. So it takes in data as an input and we'll use that to decide the output. And that can be as simple as a thermostat. It is cold, turn on a radiator. It is hot, turn off a radiator. And at the other end of the spectrum, it can be facial recognition, which is incredibly clever stuff. There are two main ways that that then manifests. First of all, we've got symbolic AI, which is pretty much flow chart math. Um, it's coding an algorithm. Video game enemies are another example of this, where an input happens, you've shot a video game enemy, and it dies, or things get harder. The other option then is machine learning, which is often used um, in the same breath as AI. I would say it's a subset of AI. Um, the data itself trains the decision-making code of the model. So for example, looking at lifetime value, there's no pre-written if this, then that. It's not flowchart option for symbolic AI. It's using all of that data to say, here's an input, and this is the output. Give me the output, what should I do? There's two um, ways to do this, as always, there are multiple options. Um, the first and the most common is supervised learning. You give a million positives and a million negatives that you have predefined. Um, so for example, um, a customer churn algorithm. We know that positive is someone comes back and buys more stuff. Negative is someone stops coming back. So you give it all of those data points um, and say, this is what good looks like, this is what bad looks like, and you can then repeat that. Unsupervised kind of does what it says. Um, we haven't defined what a good or a bad outcome is. Um, and we ask it to find patterns, to find stuff. Um, a real life example here would be customer segmentation. Here's all my customer data. 
can you please now find for me how they're differentiated and or related to each other? Many of the machine learning algorithms that we use today were actually built in the 50s and 60s. So as part of all that math stuff, most of this runs on maths. Um, in the 50s and 60s, whilst the algorithms were being designed, they couldn't be used at scale because we didn't have the computing power. And that's when neural networks come in. Um, apologies, um, there is a uh, line missing. My unsupervised should also be pointing to neural networks. So this is a subcategory of machine learning. Um, and essentially a neural network creates a web of semi-randomized decision-making nodes in a big flowchart. And then by randomly tweaking random nodes enough times, like millions and billions, it will learn what the right output is. The analogy here is a million monkeys with a million typewriters will eventually write Shakespeare. So it's doing that in a like enormously scaled sense um, using again maths now this is a black box um, and most of the stuff from big tech companies is using this approach and um, so shazam when it's telling you what song is playing um, using voice typing you speak into a phone and it will write it out for you and um, facial recognition again it's using neural networks because it allows us to run all of these different algorithms these different um, scenarios at scale the most common use for most of us in most of these situations is predictive models. Um, so what do I think the total lifetime value of a customer will be and therefore what will I pay to acquire them, to advertise to them so they become my customer? Um, what do I think they're most likely to buy and therefore I should have a recommended product when they come to my website? So predictive models. And then a new category emerged in the last kind of five to seven years, which is generative AI, which is what we're going to spend most today talking about. And that is basically using clever mathematical tricks to create new text, images, video, voice, music that haven't been seen before based on a prompt that it has been given. For large language models like um, early days chat GPT, um, you would write a written prompt, you would get a written answer. And most of these generative AI tools are now multimodal. And what that means is that whereas before you had text to text and image to image, now you can have a multiple input and get a multi output. And that's a really important step for making these as easy as possible to use. We'll see that in a little bit when we look at mid-journey, because as humans, we think in multimedia, we think in words, we think in sounds, we think in pictures. So being able to interact with these tools in a way that makes um, more sense to your average human is really, really helpful. You'll notice throughout these definitions, I keep on coming back to maths, to algorithms, um, and that brings us back to commander data uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. AI is not yet sentient. Even where the decision-making process is a neural network, even where it feels like you're having a conversation with ChatGPT, with the chatbot, even where it is a black box, it's all built on mathematical principles and it's, it's, it's not thinking in the same way as a human. The next step, so if we did this talk in maybe five years time, the next step down would be artificial general intelligence, which is much more mimicking that sentience. Um, Mark Zuckerberg for Meta, Facebook um, is looking at this. That is a little bit more scary, a little bit more um, our AI overlords are coming, uh, but for now, we're all I think safe. Now to make this perhaps a little bit easier to um, kind of have some um, touch points to think about this stuff, um, it's going to give three um, sort of buckets to think about. So machine learning, um, we touched on that. That is the um, using data to learn, to define an output, and that is things like propensity models, lifetime value predictions. AI is that umbrella term, an input gets you an output. So a thermostat doesn't have to be smart. Facial recognition, um, you can show it a picture of me that's never seen before and say, is that the same person that I am? And it will say yes or no and mathematically, computationally, super clever. And then generative AI. So the stuff that there's been so much buzz around, ChatGPT, Midjourney, 
um, Google's option, which is BARD, um, now slightly being called um, Gemini, um, and also increasingly you'll see it in a lot of the Office products that you use. There's some really cool stuff where you can give PowerPoint, um, like a presentation outline, and it will create a presentation. So that's really helpful and quite time saving. So let's dive in. Um, the good news and also the bad news is that whatever use case you can think of for AI, there is a tool for that. Um, when I pulled this slide, there were 441 million results on Google discussing generative AI. We could literally spend all day talking about this, um, and I reckon I've got about 30 minutes, so we're not going to do that. Um, instead, we're going to touch on four of the uh, most commonly spoken about, but possibly also most useful um, tools. So the first is looking at chat GPT. You can't really talk about generative AI without touching on that. Um, and this is particularly helpful from the concept of thinking about extra manpower, which we'll about infinite interns in a minute, um, and expansion and translation. We'll then look at some use cases for mid-journey, um, and that uh, I will own up to now. There are a lot of my pictures, a lot of pictures of my dog coming up, so um, bear with. Hope we have some dog lovers on the call. Um, and um, for Google Ads, um, we're then looking at more of the um, like marketing tools. How is generative AI being surfaced in the tools that marketers are using day to day? And then I cheated for my fourth option because I couldn't think of just one. Um, and we'll look at a couple of the gadgets that are available to you to make your day to day workflows a little bit easier. So let's start with ChatGPT. Uh, sign up is really simple. You go to that link um, and then you can choose the free version, which is version 3.5 or the paid version, which is version four, for the princely sum of $20 a month. If you have not yet signed up, your one action from today is to go and sign up to ChatGPT. It's completely free, go and have a play with it. Um, if you work for an organization that already has a paid for um, subscription, get access to that if you can. But it is free and it is worth having a go. Um, what might you use it for? Um, I promise to talk about infinite interns. The way that I have found most useful thinking about ChatGPT is thinking of it not as a super expert lawyer. It is not. There are still things that you need to check with people who are expert in their fields. But thinking about ChatGPT as having an army of really smart interns who will get you quite a long way, but you have to do some checking on, is quite a good way, I think, of um, positioning where ChatGPT can fit in. So, for example, it can do some research, but you wouldn't ask someone who's doing work experience with you to go away and write an entire business plan with no um, input from you and context of your business. It's great at summarising meeting notes for tidying up a transcript, but think of it as your intern, you're still going to want to do a little bit of QA. The second really helpful use case is thinking about expanding lists. Um, if you're going to be talking about some points with a client or with a key stakeholder, you want to talk about these things. What have I missed? What else could I talk about? And um, what other questions could I ask? Uh, the third example, um, and I say this with a grain of salt, given that um, a chunk of our uh, organization also does translation, but it is quite helpful at doing some initial translation um, of written copy into other languages. So um, in our digital marketing sense, here is an ad for PPC, a text ad. Can you please translate it from English to French, English to Arabic, etc. Again, going to want to QA it, going back to that infinite intern analogy, but it will get you started in a really helpful way. And then finally, um, it's quite useful as well for a start point, a sounding board. Think of it as a really helpful colleague who might not know the ins and outs of financial planning or HR law or um, like, you know legal requirements, but will be a really good sounding board for you to look at how um, you might attach a particular or sorry, approach a particular problem. So to bring this to life, um, my example here um, is maybe you work for a company that wants to expand um, its presence into another market, and we've decided that we're going to launch in Portugal. And someone has said to you, um, OK, I'm from going to Portugal, I'm going to need to pay my people there. Like, how do I set up a payroll? Could you could you go and find out? So we've asked ChatGPT um, 
And the first thing to notice here is that much like Google, if you search on Google and make a spelling mistake, um, Google will kind of correct that for you. And ChatGPT can still work even if you've made a spelling mistake. I'm old enough to remember um, when the internet was getting started and you had to go literally to different uh, search engines to get different results. But if you misspelled something, everything fell over. Um, so we're living in the future and um, ChatGPT can cope with spelling mistakes. Um, also, really definitely fact check. Um, you'll notice at the bottom, ChatGPT does now own up to the fact um, that it can make mistakes. Um, the official um, term for this, artificial intelligence, can have hallucinations. That is your data science term for today. Um, sometimes it will just make things up. Um, we said earlier, generative AI is using mathematical tricks to take all of the stuff that it knows to create new content, which means it can create the references that um, it's referring to. And there have been cases where ChatGPT has written like a medical report, quoted medical journals that don't exist. So uh, it's always worth to fact check your intern. Um, it's also really good at delving into conversation topics. So um, in this example, um, point one, it says, you need to understand local employment law. Okay, that's really helpful. Yeah, really good point. Um, can you tell me more about it? Um, and it's, rather than having to go using the Google analogy again, you'd have to go back and say, employment law in Portugal, it feels like you're having a conversation. It's a more natural way of interacting with this resource. Um, it again has owned up to the fact that it has um, limited data. Um, another test that you can do with ChatGPT, go on and ask it who the current monarch is. Um, and some versions think that we still have Queen Elizabeth, not King Charles, because the data it has access to is up to a certain point in time. So for things again like um, laws, so this was looking at the minimum wage, it's worth making sure that you have the most up-to-date information. Um, so again, context can be inferred. I've said here, do I need to set up a payroll or can I use a third party? And it knows that I'm talking about Portugal. So again, that conversational, much more user-friendly way of accessing information. Um, but again, going back to my infinite intern analogy, I happen to know that if I wanted to have an employee in Portugal, I don't have to set up a payroll or have a legal presence there. There are, I'll finish that sentence, that sounds really dodgy. Um, there are companies who are what are known as an employer of record. So someone takes on the employment um, of that person, they still work for you. Um, because I asked ChatGPT a very specific question around how do I set up payroll, that is the answer it has given me. Um, so it has gone off down this route of answering the question that I've given it, but actually it wasn't quite the answer that I was after. And that is because prompts are increasingly um, an art. This is a skill that can be learnt, but when you are prompting a generative AI, you need to use the right words in the right order, or the right images in the right order. Um, at the back of this deck, there are a number of cheat sheets that we have um, linked, and there, um, in there is one for some helpful prompts to get you started with ChatGPT, um, because some of it is like just knowing the language to use, knowing the format in which to pose these questions. Um, you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to read all the words on this slide, but starting with that top example, um, I really dislike writing press releases because I'm really bad at it. So ChatGPT is very helpful for getting you started. I can ask it, hey ChatGPT, act as a PR specialist, draft a press release for blah, announcing blah. And that'd be great. But you can see the rest of the prompt here then gets really specific, saying include a headline, um, give me a concise summary, put in some quotes, make sure that you can direct people for where like, they should go to with press inquiries, use the traditional press release format. Being really specific in your prompt will get you a much better output. Um, but as I said, knowing where to start with that, we've provided some examples um, to give you a bit of a shortcut. So some top tips then for ChatGPT. The answer that you get from it will mostly be as good as your question. So keep on asking, keep on refining. Think of it again as that helpful colleague, those infinite interns. You need to slightly direct the conversation. Provide as much information as you can, 
Remember that all this stuff is going in the cloud, so if it's super confidential, maybe don't share um, people's you know, private information. Um, and tell it if it's going down the wrong path. These are static images that I've provided here. But when you type in a question to ChatGPT, you'll see the answer getting written. If it's going completely down the wrong, um, like wrong path, you can literally ask it to stop. If you want to include images in your prompt, you'll need the paid for version. Um, and remember, it's not sentient, even if you ask it if it is and it says it is. Um, it is looking at um, large language models using um, AI mathematical tricks to create new content. So that was ChatGPT. Um, we're now going to talk about Midjourney. Um, accessing Midjourney is a little bit harder because actually the first thing you need to do is sign up to Discord, but that makes you really cool. So that is a, a good thing to be doing. Once you have a Discord account, then go to Midjourney um, and you can sign in. Now, Midjourney also has a free um, option, um, but they are, it's quite hard to get onto that free version. Um, a paid for subscription for Midjourney is around £10 a month. Um, again, if your organisation has a paid for subscription, ask about how you can access it. Um, and if you can get the free version, there are some pros and cons to that as well. If you do have the paid for version and you do not want people to see your work, it's worth setting up your own server. So you access Midjourney via Discord. That's how you interact with it. Um, everything that you do in Midjourney is open. It is accessible to everyone. You can go to the Midjourney website and you'll see a whole host of images that have been created by everyone who is using this tool. And there are public channels. So for the free version, you're in a public channel. Literally everyone can see what you're typing, can see the output that is coming out of it. So if you don't want people to see that, um, it is worth setting up your own server. Loads of guidance on the internet, actually comparatively simple. You set up the server, you invite the bot, that's how you're interacting with Midjourney. Um, but if you have a paid for version, the most useful feature is a thing called stealth mode. So if you are working within your own server, no one can see what you're doing, but your images get uploaded back to Midjourney. In stealth mode, no one else will see what you're doing. If you work in marketing and you are you know, creating content for a client and perhaps it's the launch of a new product, I would argue that other people seeing that before the product is ready is probably not terribly helpful and stealth mode, super quick to enable, um, would be a very valuable um, thing to toggle on. So how do you use Midjourney? You've set up your Discord account, you've got your server, you've invited the Midjourney bot, and then you get to play with it. Um, so every prompt into Midjourney starts with imagine. This is a creative tool, um, and it is asking you to run wild and free with all of the um, depth of human imagination. Um, but like ChatGPT, you may need to refine the prompt, the inputs that you're giving it to get the best output. So a really simple example here, um, I asked it to imagine a Labrador dog sleeping on a tartan bed. And it's given me four options here. Um, top two are yellow Labradors, and then I've got a chocolate Labrador and maybe a silver, um, and it's on a red tartan. So most commonly, Midjourney has seen red tartans and 50-50 of the different types of dogs. At the bottom, those um, U1, U2, V1, V2. Um, the U line is basically saying, if you want to upscale one of those images, so if I was like, really like the first one, I would like that big, please, rather than a grid of four, U1 would extract that image for me. And then the V1, V2 is asking for variance. So I might think, that first picture, pretty much, much what I was after, but just not quite right. Um, so if I said V1, it would give me four more options with the same prompt of that type of picture. However, if we're thinking again about the need to be specific and to refine your prompts, the option on the right here, I've specified that I would like a chocolate Labrador, so the specific color of dog, and also the type of um, tartan that I wanted and the style in which I wanted it to sleep. It's not quite nailed it, but you can see that the images on the right are different from the images on the left. I promise you lots of pictures of my dog. Uh, the picture on the left uh, is Tally, my dog, um, at the train station after getting extraordinarily wet on the walk. Um, and she's wearing her dressing gown so that we don't stick out, stink out all the other commuters. 
Um, somebody said to me, she looks like a superhero, and um, I'm pretty sure the creators of Mid Journey were not expecting people to try and turn their dog into a superhero, but it seemed like a really good use of the tool. Um, so I have input that picture as a start point. I said earlier, I'm not terribly creative. Um, so I said, I would like that dog, that picture um, as a superhero. And it has given me four like pretty decent options. However, what was in my head was more of like Superman vibe. I wanted like a cape in the wind. Um, I wanted, you know, like the arm in the air. I wanted the whole shebang. Um, so I then made my uh, prompt more specific. I said I would like this dog as a superhero, wearing a cape, with a cape, um, flying through the air, and I'd like it in a cartoon style. And again, some pretty good options there, bottom right being my favourite. Um, but it still wasn't quite what I was after. So I refined the prompt thinking, okay, maybe what it's not getting, um, it's making the cape fly, but I would like the dog to fly. Um, and so I've put in a comma, the word order doesn't really make much difference in Mid Journey. There are other um, other features we'll look at in a second um, that helps understand how you're weighting and the types of um, creative output that you, you are after. So um, it's not really done very much here. So keep testing, like what, what is it in my prompt that's, that's not working, that's not getting me to the output that I want? Um, so I was like, okay, maybe it just doesn't know how to make a flying dog. Um, because, you know, he does. Um, so I asked for the dog to be flying and um, we've got some pretty good flying options there. She looks, I would say, pretty majestic. Um, but again, it's still not what I was after. So I was like, I would like the dog to be flying, but I would like her to be flying like Superman. Um, and then if anything, she's now flying less. Um, so that again, wasn't what I was after. Again, you can use images as another reference. So if you're finding it hard to describe what it is that you're after, an image, can get you um, part of the way there. Earlier when I was going through the definitions, we spoke about things now being multimodal. So this is a great example of where I've given it text and I've given it an image, multimodal input, to give me an image output. Um, and top left, bottom right, pretty good, getting some good Superman vibes. Um, bottom right doesn't really look like the Labrador, but like great flying. Uh, but also, yikes, um, Mid Journey is still not brilliant um, at arms and legs and hands um, and there are ways that you can navigate that to make sure that you don't have uh, truly terrifying um, images like this. So prompts much like ChatGPT they are a skill and a skill that can be learnt so being really clear about the context and the details really important and then I promise you some, some hints and tips so a double colon will allow mid journey to separate concepts, so equal weighting or, or not. Um, it will always default to its house style unless you specify otherwise. So maybe you want a cartoon style, close up, watercolor, photorealistic. Wes Anderson um, is a recognized style as well, pop art. Um, and then some very specific things, so aspect ratio, maybe you don't want it to be square, maybe you want a more traditional photo, you can ask for that. Um, you can ask there to be no something, so no hands, um, and also things like lighting. You can be as specific as like with bright daylight or with spotlight. So to bring that to life, the examples on the right hand side there, um, it's a very specific prompt. We have a yellow Labrador as a cartoon superhero flying over a battle scene, moody weather, cape ruffling in the wind with an aspect ratio of four to three. And again, pretty majestic. Um, however, if we want the, the battlefield um, or, and the weather to have equal weighting, in the option at the bottom, the double colon is saying that the battle scene and the weather need to be equally weighted. And the options that you see at the bottom, quite similar to the options at the top, with slightly more weight um, on that battle scene. So that was fun for me, if not for you, to look at pictures of my dog. Um, but What's the business use case? Like, when would we actually use this um, other than creating pictures of your dog as a superhero? So four key use cases for mid journey in um, a real life environment. The first is around content and concept ideation. So get those creative juices flowing, write a better creative brief. The copyright 
um, rules, laws around this are still a bit murky. So if you are using Midjourney to create a hero asset for your brand, I would argue that might not be the most future facing. Using it to do the ideation that someone then goes away and actually creates a final asset for you um, feels a bit more comfortable um, because you can be more confident that you own the copyright to that particular image, to a logo. Um, so just think quite carefully around um, how willing you are to risk not owning um, a creative asset. The second, the reason it's in bold, um, is that this is again a really common use case. Um, where a creative or a rights-free image doesn't exist, and you want a specific creative variant um, for an ad, for a, bob, for a blog post, um, it's really useful for icons. It can do those small bits of creative. There are lots of other things out there, something like um, Unsplash um, has loads of free images that you can use. So um, don't reinvent the wheel. There might already be something that's existing, but where you have a quite a specific small thing, Midjourney can kind of be your emergency creative department. It can also do low cost creative tweaks. So make this jumper green, not red. Um, make this Labrador yellow, not, not brown. Um, make this um, more of a close up. That, so those small creative tweaks that ordinarily would get stuck in a creative uh, production queue, um, a good way to navigate that. And I think it's also really important to remember that this really hits the, the new, the cool factor. Um, for those of us that work in marketing, we like the new, we like the shiny. And to show that you are using it and to test where those use cases are um, will set you up for success in the longer term. So we have spoken about ChatGPT, your infinite interns and your helpful colleague. We have spoken about Midjourney and your uh, emergency creative department and some ideation plus the cool factor. Um, and now I want to talk about some of the tools that are available to marketers, particularly in the digital space. Generative AI is essentially everywhere. Everyone has got it plugged in. Um, everyone's talking about their Gen AI capabilities, their AI capabilities. But some of this is not as accessible as it sounds, um, or you know, it's not quite as accessible as it says on the tin. So Google Cloud, um, has loads of really interesting generative AI models, as does Azure. Um, so two of the big um, cases, AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, there's loads of like models that you can use and that's great and suddenly everyone's a data scientist, but unfortunately it doesn't quite work like that in reality. To use all of these um, you know, out of the box generative AI models, you need to have a data warehouse, you need to have data pipelines set up, you need to have like a hypothesis that you're actually trying to test. And even though it is low code, it still requires some coding. So this stuff will very likely make your data teams more efficient, but it is not going to make someone with no experience suddenly into a data scientist. So in-platform tools work best when you have some knowledge of the platform. Because of that, we're gonna focus on some of the slightly more out the box tools that are available to us as marketers. The image on the left is, or the GIF on the left, um, is from Meta, from Facebook, and it's a thing called image outcropping, which is mind-blowingly clever, I think. Um, you can put in a square creative that perhaps you have had um, produced for your Instagram grid, for a Facebook post, but if you want to be advertising or to be showing your, um, in this uh, case, your, your beauty products in a stories format, so it's 16 by nine, Previously, you'd have to go back, you'd have to get it recreated, it just takes ages and then nothing's happening. But at a click of a button, Meta can now create an image that looks on brand, that is in keeping with the original image, and that you can now um, share in those, in those formats. Um, I've said this before, we are living in the future. On the right hand side, um, this is the Google equivalent. So this is Performance Max. Um, it's their product that, takes all of your amazing um, setup from um, a search perspective and allows you to scale that across all of the other channels. So YouTube, the display network, um, Gmail, etc. But to do that, you need assets in a different way than you do in search. Search ad, the stuff you see at the top down the sides when you go to Google, typically like static text. 
And um, as a marketing agency, one of the pushbacks we get from our clients from saying, this is an amazing product, it's giving you more reach, it's really efficient. And they go, but I haven't got any creative. Like, I, 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 can't, I can't do this, I haven't got any images um, to be able to put against my ad and therefore it won't serve. This um, particular feature is being rolled out this year by Google. And again, incredibly impressive. You can feed it some images and it will create an ad with the relevant call to action, the copy that has already been approved for your search account and just create all the assets that you need to be able to roll that out um, in your marketing activities. Now, none of these are done purely from the, the good of the hearts of um, Meta and Google, because what they're trying to get you to do is to spend more money in their platform. And if you have the creatives, if you have the, um, the ads that are going to resonate with customers, people are more likely to click on them. You're more likely to make sales, generate leads, and therefore you are more likely to spend more money with them. So it's not purely about um, just being really, really helpful, even though it is, it's about enabling you to spend more money in their platform, um, but worth, worth knowing that they're there. Um, finally, within this uh, section on marketing tools, I want to touch briefly on GA4. Um, this is the most common web analytics tool. Um, a number of marketers um, and also non-marketers um, have used it. And um, GA4 in particular has been built in response to the cookie-less future, GDPR, all of that um, very good, exciting stuff. Using AI and analytics can get complicated really, really quickly. Um, and as with all, well, anything to do with data, if you put rubbish in, you'll get rubbish out. But GA4 has got loads of really helpful out of the box tools. And one of the things that they have built into it um, is the ability to basically run some analysis on your data and surface some insights. Now, some of those aren't particularly helpful. Um, so for example, your sales page has higher conversion than your home page. You're like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, but these, um, these insights, these ability to kind of just run some analysis, it's just included for free. Like GA4 can be a free tool. You can um, have a pay for option as with all things, but it's just available to you. And I think the example for me that really summarizes just how far we have come in the last like seven years um, is that little screen grab at the bottom. Digital marketing, we think quite often about attribution. Um, so how do I know that this ad that I have shown has ended up in a sale. How can I attribute my marketing activity to a sale? And people used to look most often at last click. Someone has clicked on a search ad, they've gone and bought a pair of shoes. I have paid 10p for my search ad and the shoes were hundred pounds. What a great um, ROI. However, we know that that is not how a consumer journey typically works. So someone might have clicked on a search ads to go and buy the thing, but maybe they saw a creative when they were scrolling on Instagram, or maybe they're on TikTok and saw an influencer extolling the virtues of these particular shoes. Um, so in that sense, we're looking more at a multi-touch attribution model. The screen grab at the bottom, um, we've got two options there, last click and data driven. There's no um, revenue. This is a real client, uh, not because they have no revenue, but because their key KPI is actually lead generation. So no revenue is uh, tracked by their website. But those two options, that last click, the last thing that happened, and data driven, we want to know all the interactions that we can within a GDPR, GDPR compliant sense. Seven years ago, you had to have an entire data science team running the maths. You had to have a different um, tool in some instances to be able to create it, to create that analysis. And because of the advances in AI, Google just now throws that in for free. And as I said before, we're living in the future. Um, as a marketer, this like slightly blows my mind that at a click of a button, you can now see this. Um, whereas before it was just so much more complicated. So my final bucket of useful generative AI tools for you um, was looking at some of the gadgets that are available. Those of you that remember earlier in the presentation, we said there are 441 million search results looking just at generative AI. And if there's a use case, there is a tool for it. Um, 
I've mentioned a few times the cheat sheets that we've shared, so one for ChatGPT, one for kind of how to navigate mid-journey, um, but also one around some of the other tools that are out there and some of the costing models that sit behind them. If you have a specific use case, somebody somewhere has probably built the tool for you already. So to call um, a couple out from, um, from this slide, Otter, a really amazing tool, which does meeting notes and transcription. So it will sit in the background on a call and it will literally type out word for word what is being discussed. It can recognize different speakers and it can then do a summary of the notes at the end. Incredible tool. Obviously, always check that people who are being recorded are happy to be recorded. But what an amazing resource. No more um, writing up meeting notes or if you work in consulting and have to do take hold of interviews, you don't have to write up all the notes. So that is, that is now very helpful. Um, GitHub Copilot for the people that um, particularly look at more um, engineering, data engineering, data science. Incredibly powerful resource. If you've already got some really good um, base principles, it can help refine and speed up um, code and um, reviews. It can kind of give advice, give prompts. So Copilot, there being a really good way of thinking about it. If we said ChatGPT is infinite interns, um, the Copilot um, functionality, it's not replacing your data engineers, but it's helping helping to make them more efficient. Um, Canva um, is another good example, so really good graphic design um, for stuff that is a bit more complicated than perhaps um, Photoshop, which is the, the OG um, of photo editing. Um, but Canva, like, yes, it can do some cool stuff. You can also do that in mid-journey. ChatGPT increasingly is also handling images. Um, and I mentioned at the top of the call that um, PowerPoint actually is increasingly um, getting good at creating like really good, interesting decks, perhaps not necessarily an individual creative. Now, the point of that is that all of these things combined, there is quite a lot of overlap. So whether you want to do everything in ChatGPT, like it can summarize meeting notes, but maybe Otter can do a better example. Um, maybe for your creative, maybe mid journey is fine. Maybe you don't need anything that complicated. Maybe Canva is fine. It's always coming back to what is the use case, what you're trying to solve for, and what is the cost um, of, of answering that question. So to close, we've made it to the end. Um, some, some key kind of do's and don'ts, I guess. We've run through a number of tools, the use cases, like the practical things that you can be using them for. Um, so as you kind of leave this webinar and you think about what am I going to do next with all this information, go and play with the tools. Um, but in a work sense, um, a really important thing is to agree the policy for your organisation. If your organisation does not want to use AI at all, that would make me a bit nervous. Um, but where does it fit in? Like, what tools do you have access to? What information do you want to, to give it? Some organisations won't use ChatGPT because they're not confident in where the data is going. Um, but Microsoft have some really um, interesting approaches to that. Um, remember to refine your prompts when you are asking, when you're putting a prompt into any of these tools. If you don't get the right answer the first time, refine practice use the examples that are available to kind of get you started and ask the question in the right way. Um, and also consider alternative tools. Not everything has to be AI. If you want an image, for example, there might already be one out there that is open source and available to you. And then finally, on the don't side of the equation, um, don't ignore copyright. This stuff is still work in progress. So if you are creating content, whether it is written word or an image, if that is essential to your business, just think twice about whether that is exclusively coming from these generative AI tools. Um, don't ignore the potential of these. I would argue that doing nothing is not an option. Play with them, see what you can do, think how it can improve and help your workflows. And then finally, don't forget to QA, particularly anything that is written, uh, long form content, translation. Um, these tools are not infallible in the same way that humans are not infallible. So if you would QA work that another human has done, you should be QAing the work that is coming out of ChatGPT, MidJourney, etc. 
Um, finally, for those of you that have the handout, uh, the helpful button that says view sheets here hopefully will take you to our website where you can download the three cheat sheets that I've mentioned throughout this talk. Thank you very much. That was brilliant, uh, Sophie. Um, certainly blew my mind. Um, we've got loads and loads of questions actually, so I'm going to dive in fairly quickly. Please. Um, just a reminder though, if you want, if anybody wants to find out more about the Marketing Club, um, if you take a photo of the QR code on screen now, you'll be able to uh, find your way to the Marketing Club webpage. Also, uh, please uh, continue to um, respond to this uh, seminar on the socials by using the hashtag CIM events. Okay, Sophie, uh, the very first question then. Um, have you ever used ChatGPT, sorry, ChatGPT for infographics? How do you ask prompts for it to design a book paper, for example? Um, sorry, you crackled a little bit at the end, so I didn't catch the end of the last question. So it was um, about using ChatGPT for infographics, and have yeah. you ever asked it to design a white paper, for example? I ever asked it to design a white paper. Um, so I would always use ChatGPT as an input, um, not as a not as a kind of total. So from a, to, I make sure I answer both potentials of that question. So one from a graphic design point of view, um, I personally haven't used it to like do the graphic design for something. Um, but that's partly because we have some very excellent designers in house. Um, and going back to, I'm still a little bit leery of, um, particularly for an infographic, which is the kind of thing that gets shared quite a lot. I want to retain the copyright on that. Um, so I would use ChatGPT to get me started, but I would then refine it. So that's the graphic design side of things. If it's around the content, again, really good for ideation, but with a white paper, what I always challenge my team to come up with is some new insight. Um, and ChatGPT is not going to do that. We're going to need to do some research, to do some thinking. It can maybe help with the ideation, um, but won't give me necessarily something completely new um, that I would trust. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, great. Thanks, Sophie. Um, how do these AI platforms cope with integrating branding? Can they generate images to brand guidelines? Uh, yes. Um, so, Again, coming back to you, what is your use case? Um, some of them are better than others at feeding in, like some of the stuff is um, easier to articulate than others. So like a font um, or RGB values, um, so sorry, like the color palette that you use for a brand. Um, you can feed it example tone of voice as well. Um, we have actually used that successfully on one of our clients where they've got a really particular tone of voice and we've been able to train the model over time to be able to like respond in a way that we want. So you, you can do that, but you need to put the um, effort and um, or the, yeah, the work in basically up front to define it and feed it in. So the short answer is yes, you can do that. Great. Okay. Um, do you think generative AI will take away some marketing jobs? Uh, if yes, what suggestions would you give to future marketers on how to better equip themselves, what skills should they learn? Um, so the depressing answer is yes, but the exciting answer is also yes. Um, it is absolutely going to take away some jobs, but the analogy that I would give, if from a if from a marketing standpoint, um, Meta turned I think twenty this year. Google is a bit over 30. 20 years ago, PPC as an industry didn't really exist. 15, 10 to 15 years ago, paid social as a, a job offer didn't exist. Now the quid pro quo of that is that some of the more traditional media roles, so people who used to focus on linear TV and how do you how do you make sure that your ad appears on the X Factor, um, X Factor final um, ad break? No, that is like an old school purpose to example. Those type of jobs have gone away, but at the same time, more digital jobs have come in. So generative AI, it is going to change the type of jobs that are available, but it's not. it doesn't mean that there's no career in marketing. It means that the career in marketing is interesting and exciting. And then the next part of that is okay. Well, great. What what skills? Um, 
what capabilities do I need to have? From a creative standpoint, if you are a creative person who comes up with brilliant ideas, you are always going to have a job. If you can talk to clients and you can help them navigate this new world um, from a planning, from an audience perspective, you are always going to have a job. Um, so I would encourage you to work on the soft skills. How do you talk to people? How do you interact? How do you translate from human um, to computer to human? I would encourage you to work on data skills. How can you analyze information? How can you take all of the stuff that's out there and turn it into a plan that can then harness generative AI, can harness the tools that are available to us? Um, and then finally, I would encourage you to play around to learn some of these tools because you'll be working with Luddites like me for whom the stuff still slightly blows their mind. And if you can come and you can help the organisations that you're working with to harness the new, the exciting, the different, you will go really, really pretty well. So join marketing. Marketing is good. Um, there's quite a few questions around copyright. Um, for example, can you explain copyright implications for using Gen AI for image creation? Who owns copyright on the images generated? Yeah, so with the caveat that I'm not a lawyer. Um, there, so copyright law is typically quite far behind the technology because the technology goes quicker than, than copyright. If you use something like Mid Journey to create a new image, um, a logo, do you own it or does Mid Journey own it? Particularly if you haven't got a paid for um, a paid for account. If you look at the terms of service, like when you create something, you are sending it back up into the cloud for them to learn from. You've used their servers, and the image lives in their cloud. So you could argue that they own it. Um, so, from for an image, if you are creating something that then lives on your website and it is your hero image for your product, for your for your website, for your brand, there is a genuine risk that at some point in future, Mid Journey or any of these other tools, they will actually we own that because you created it in our stack and you didn't pay for it, or even if you did. Copyright law is different in every country as well, so that adds an extra layer, of, like fun. Um, I can't off the top of my head remember the countries where um, copyright is absolutely fine, but it's something like Israel and Venezuela. Um, so in the UK, copyright law is still a bit murky around these points. So it's probably fine for the next couple of years, but in the same way, if I use an analogy of like um, data capture, EDPR came in in 2015, 2018. Um, all the stuff that came before that where you have different cookie banners and people are scraping up data on the internet and the Cambridge Analytica scandal, it took a long time for legislation to catch up to what was being done with this information. And I would say that from a generative AI perspective and copyright in particular, my, my crystal ball is saying that in three to five years time, there's gonna be an awful lot more um, both legislation and guidance around who owns what. So if an image, if a piece of content is critical to your business, I personally think that there is too much risk in relying exclusively on Gen AI content if you know you're definitely going to want to keep it. It might be fine. It's up to you to decide how much risk you're willing to take. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, thanks, so I'm just going to have a bit of a minefield this one. Um, okay, where do you see the biggest untapped opportunities for applying generative AI in digital marketing? Um, I think at the moment the biggest opportunity is kind of in first mover advantage um, and that doesn't have to mean creating something really big and shiny and exciting. Where um, a crowd where we're seeing real benefits is in increasing efficiency. So for example one of our clients operates in the Middle East um, and much like there's a difference between uh, British English, Australian English, American English, there's lots of different Arabic dialects. So if you're creating ad copy for this client, they're in seven markets, that's seven different variants 
And in the past, it would have to go out to multiple people. It would take ages for them to, um, like, you know, update their copy, make sure they were happy. It would come back. At, like, it just took a really long time. Using ChatGPT, we can do a start point that says, please take this copy and translate it into the following six dialects. And then that gets QA'd. Doing that has saved a day of what, like, back and forth to get um, ads updated and, and rolled out. Now, that is one isolated example for one use case in one market on one client. You start to multiply that across all of your different features. So summarizing meeting notes for, um, you know, adding, I don't know, improving the speed with which you're creating presentations to um, better ideation to like just all of those little, those little bits. If you work in a sizable organization that really quickly adds up um, and in a marketing sense means that you've got massive untapped opportunity to free up the brain space of your people to then look at what's next. And then what's next might be the really clever stuff like doing brilliant propensity models that mean the advertising that you are paying for is suddenly a hundred times more efficient. So like my suggestion would be you do as much as you can to get those operational efficiencies, use the, the small things because all those five minutes add up. And then you have the headspace, look at the big, the shiny, the, the um, predictive models that will become then a um, performance differentiator. Um, there's still loads of questions uh, that come in, but I'm, I've only got time for I have to ask you one more actually, Sophie, and then we're going to have to call, call a halt. So, Final question for today is, um, my company focused on AI, but only for coding or big development projects. How can I persuade my marketing director that we need to be using generative AI for our usual marketing activity? Yeah, um, that is a, a common um, a common challenge. Um, my people go, well, AI means coding, right? Um, my suggestion to you um, is to use the tools at your disposal. ChatGPT can start to create brilliant blog content. Um, you want to check it, you want to tweak it, um, but it can help drive that efficiency. Um, we've mentioned copy creation. We've mentioned using some of the tools that are already available within um, digital marketing channels like the image outcropping for Meta, the asset production for Performance Max. So when you are looking at your marketing plans, try and identify where you can use some of these tools to create them the proof points that mean it's really hard to argue that you need to scale it. Um, most people in marketing really like a test and learn. Um, so that is good language to try and get this stuff off the ground and get some momentum. Um, I'm also happy for you to quote me and say that I said that if you're not doing something, you'll get left behind. That might also help. Sophie, thank you very much for that. Um, Sophie, that was brilliant. Um, unfortunately, though, that's all we've got time for for today. Um, again, I'd just like to thank Sophie for delivering a fantastic presentation and we hope you've enjoyed the session and found it interesting and worthwhile. And just a final mention again that you can download the cheat sheets Sophie mentioned by going onto the resources page on the Crowd website, that's crowd.com. So that leaves me to say a final thank you to you for joining us today. We do hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Take care everyone. We look forward to seeing you again soon.